The Honorable Dr. Sri Fadila Yusuf, Senior Minister of Works Malaysia, Excellency, Mr. Michael Walsh, Chairman of the Pacific Basin Economic Council, PPEC, Dr. Sri Mohammad Iqbal, Chairman Economic Club of Kuala Lumpur, ECKL, our distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen. Selamat pagi and selamat datang. We bid you all a very warm welcome and a good morning to this Asia Economic and Entrepreneurship Summit. I must thank the Pacific Basin Economic Council, PBAC, together with the Economic Club of Kuala Lumpur and China Daily for supporting and co-organizing this summit once again with us. This year's Asia Economic and Entrepreneurship Summit is held amidst the global pandemic, affecting lives and livelihoods, and in many countries, politics as well. Many countries already are developing recovery strategies and exit plans to transition to a new normal. I believe that Asia's recovery requires the three Cs, coordination, cooperation, and clarity. I think these three Cs are very vital for countries to transition to the new normal, where there is better coordination, there's better cooperation between the public, private, and third sectors, and also greater clarity in the key trusts and policies of the different governments. We believe that RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, and CPTPP, would be game changers for Asia to enhance regional competitiveness as well as regional economic cooperation. We therefore hope that both RCEP and PTPP can be rolled out and ratified quickly by all the countries involved. Asia's recovery also requires inclusive and sustainable development and a much stronger commitment to the UN's Agenda 2020, setting out the 17 strategic uh, sustainable development goals. We believe that greater tripartite cooperation will be necessary to achieve and realize these 17 SDGs. We need to enhance cooperation between the public, private sector, as well as civil society. Here in Malaysia, there is a Malaysia CSO SDG Alliance that brings together 52 think tanks and civil society organizations to embark on the partnership with the government and business community to achieve the SDGs. At the same time, there is also an all party parliamentary group on the SDGs here in Malaysia that brings together MPs, members of parliament from both sides of the political divide to concentrate on localizing SDGs in the constituency ground level. And I think this will be very essential initiatives to help us move forward towards a faster acceleration of the SDGs. We believe also that digital transformation and green growth will be key drivers for economic growth in Asia. And I'm delighted that we have so many distinguished speakers who will be joining us on the green economy section, as well as on the digital economy session to share their valuable thoughts and insights and how Asia can achieve digital transformation and move forward with climate action and environmental protection to ensure we achieve the green economy. Climate change, climate action, and green technology will help the region transition to this new normal that needs to address some of the key challenges posed by environmental degradation as well as climate change. Finally, I believe that Asia also needs the three eyes to build that better. Innovation, investment, and infrastructure. And it is because of the importance of infrastructure development as a key driver of economic recovery and growth. We have invited this morning, Malaysia's senior 
Minister of Works, who is in charge of infrastructure development, to share with us his thoughts on sustainable infrastructure as a way forward. So once again, I'd like to thank the Minister. I'd like to thank all our many speakers for honouring us today with your presence. And thank you also to our corporate sponsors and partners for your support. So again, Tramakase, thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Tan Sri Matthew, President of KSI Strategic Institute for Asia Pacific for the welcoming remarks. Now we have another welcome speech uh, by Mr. Andrew Weir, Chairman of the Pacific Basin Economic Council. Andrew, over to you. Good morning, everybody. And it's always a great pleasure to be sharing a stage with Tan Sri Michael Yeo. Michael, thank you very much for your leadership and thank you very much to KSI Strategic Institute for Asia Pacific in having the entrepreneurship and leadership uh, to set up such a summit. Uh, I chair Pacific Basin Economic Council. It has been going for over 50 years now. And its role is to enhance communication between governments and businesses and between the economies in the Pacific Basin. My personal view is when you look at the global situation, geopolitics, some of the regional issues, never has it been more important to have organizations uh, such as KSI and PBEC, where people can come together, share ideas and collaborate and give a voice of business and a voice on the importance of trade in an objective and professional manner. And we treasure very much all our members, all our alliances, where we're able to discuss, share and sometimes even shape the trade debate in the Pacific Basin reason. I agree with Michael on everything he's just said. I, I think it was an exceptional overview. But if I could just make one variant, Michael said the three C's, and I totally agree on the three C's. But my three C's are slightly different. I endorse Michael's three C's. So maybe mine are the fourth, fifth, and sixth C's, which is connectivity, collaboration, and communication. And I think this has been a time where coming together, working together is so, so important. So on behalf of PBEC, I'd like to say we're so proud uh, to be with KSI Strategic Institute for Asia Pacific today. We're particularly proud to support our colleagues in PBEC in Malaysia. Uh, we were so excited about APAC coming to Malaysia um, in recent years. And I think we we're all disappointed that because of COVID, uh, we weren't able to meet in person. But I think the role of Malaysia in the new normal, the exciting plans of the Malaysian government in the new normal, and the role Malaysia plays, I think is very, very important to us at PBEC. So we look to learning more. So maybe just a couple of reflections on the agenda. I think, uh, Zaim, I think you can be assured you have all the right topics on the agenda, be it infrastructure, be it digital transformation, be it the next step on Indo-Asia Pacific development. And I think coming back with a heading on the new normal, what is it? Rebuilding resilience, agility, overcoming challenges. These are all the right themes. And I'm sure everybody listening today will leave the conference with maybe three to five things they had, had not really thought about before, or maybe things they want to reflect to back in their day job. The foundation has to be agility and resilience, governance, a renewed sense of purpose, and a renewed sense of innovation and entrepreneurship. And I'm convinced of those strong foundations, coupled with the incredible macro long-term structural growth story uh, in Asia Pacific, the future for us is very, very rosy. However, it won't be a smooth path. There'll be winners and losers. And I think the purpose of today is for us to listen to very experienced people, reflect on what's saying, and then think how can we position our own organizations and our own policy making in a way to make best use of the opportunity so we actually do secure all the growth and all the opportunity which is undoubtedly there. So with that, I'd just like to conclude my remarks and just reiterate how proud I am as chairman of PBEC to be here today and how grateful we are to be a co-organizer and part of such a wonderful conference. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, 
Mr. Andrew Boyer, uh, Chairman of uh, Pacific Basin Economic Council. If I can just quickly recap the points mentioned by the two esteemed speakers, uh, they mentioned about the three Cs. There were multiple Cs, actually. The three Cs for my, Francis Michael was co coordination, cooperation, clarity. And from Andrew is connectivity, collaboration, and cooperation. And uh, Tansri had a three Is, innovation, investment, and infrastructure. All of these ingredients are important for us to build back better in the after COVID era, AC, because the BC, before COVID era, has uh, it's no longer... Uh, relevant for us, we have to move on and, and adapt and be resilient in the new uh, COVID era. And there were points on uh, ratifying CPTPP and RCEP as trade agreements that will propel the region to the next level of growth. And there was an emphasis on sustainability, climate change in action, uh, because you know COVID-19 has taught us that if we don't uh, protect the planet and its people, then you know, we will be in peril in the, in the next few years and decades to come, especially for our next generation. There was also an emphasis on digital transformation. Uh, the COVID-19 has, has taught us that you know, we can adapt and adopt to new normals with digital tools and, and, and visualizations. And we need to uh, press on with digital transformation now that we have uh, gotten used to virtual events like this, which would have been unthinkable just two years ago. And these were very interesting points laid by both Andrew and Tracy Michael. So thank you for those uh, opening remarks. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I have the honor and privilege of inviting the Honorable Datuk Suri Haji Fadilah bin Haji Yusof, the Senior Minister and Minister of Works Malaysia, to deliver the opening keynote address on building sustainability infrastructure for economic growth. Dia Tan Sri Michael Yeo, Presiden KSI Strategic Institute for Asia Pacific or KSI, Mr Andrew Weir, Chairman Pacific Basin Economic Council or PBEC, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, Assalamualaikum Warahmatullahi Wabarakatuh and a warm welcome to all of you. Firstly, let me express my greatest appreciation and gratitude the organizing committee, KSI Strategic Institute for Asia Pacific, Pacific Basin Economic Council, and China Daily for the gracious invitation to the 2021 Asia Economic and Entrepreneurship Summit with the theme Building Sustainable Infrastructure for Economic Growth. The infrastructure assets and services provides the basic physical and organizational structures that defines the, de the efficient functionality of an economy and its social dynamics. Therefore, access to reliable, quality, efficient and affordable infrastructure services are critical in reducing poverty, promoting economic growth, supporting social development and building resilient communities. Overall, there is a lack in access to basic physical infrastructure, including roads, pipe water supply, improved sanitation and electricity in the global population. Moreover, services may be unreliable, poor quality, inefficiently supplied or unaffordable. These conditions impose constraints to human health, quality of life, education and employment particularly in the rural areas. In Malaysia, infrastructure development, which is one of the main drivers of, of economic growth, will receive a big boost in the 12th Malaysia Plan, running from 2021 to 2025, to assist the sector in reviving the economy. It, was, it is also expected that the budget for the 12th Malaysia Plan is set to beat previous Malaysia Plan's budget with a higher amount of more than 250 billion ringgit. As we embrace the concept the concept sustainable and quality infrastructure, the Ministry of Works Malaysia will launch the National Construction Policy 2030 or in short NCP 2030 with the theme digitalizing the construction sector to accelerate the adoption of technology in all work processes before, during and after construction. The Malaysian construction sector is set to move in tandem with Sustainable Development Goals or SDG through the NCP 2030 strategic trusts and align with other initiatives including the Shared Prosperity Vision 2030 or SPV 2030 to help Malaysia achieve 
sustainable growth encompassing fair and equitable distribution across income groups, ethnic cities and regions. Ladies and gentlemen, and gentlemen in today's environment, climate change is impacting communities across the globe in unprecedented ways like rising sea levels, extreme weather, food and water insecurity, resource scarcity and conflict, which render us reason not to build infrastructure like we normally do. As such, we need urgent and preemptive actions through new collaboration and partnerships for ambitious new ideas to mitigate climate change. We'll ha we will have to build smart infrastructures by designing, building and operating infrastructure in ways which will bring and maintain sound economic development while at the same time protecting our vital natural resources and environment. Above all, I believe resilient and inclusive infrastructure which are sustainable can change our lives. The whole life cycle of the infrastructure development must promote more effective and efficient use of financial resources, carbon footprint consideration, social cohesion and stewardship of natural ecosystems. As stipulated in the NCP 2030, the Ministry of Work continuously promotes sustainable development throughout the life cycle of construction by addressing environmental issues such as development planning, implementation of design, green procurement, construction management method, operation and maintenance of assets, asset management, renovation and demolishing of structures and low carbon development. In driving the National Sustainable Development Agenda, the Ministry of Work through its various agencies has introduced various initiatives to meet this goal. Among the initiatives are as follow. 1. Specification for building projects that encourage contractors to use green products such as products that are eco-labeling or my hijau mark. 2. Introduction of the Sustainable Infrastar Green Building Index or GBI and My Green Highway Index. 3. Requirement for Construction Waste Management Plan or CWMP for managing waste systematically to reduce reuse and recycle approach. 4. Specification that requires contractor to ensure all waste generated on sites in accordance with the Solid Waste and Public Cleansing Management Act 2007 and Environmental Quality Act 1974. 5. Building Information Modeling or BIM as a modeling technology an associated set of processes to produce, communicate, analyze and use digital information models throughout the construction project life cycle. 6. Usage of Industrialized Building System or IBS for government projects in order to reduce resources and waste. 7. Improving design standards towards sustainable development by considering life cycle perspective. And, and eight, application of MSO ISO 14001 Environmental Management System or EMS certification and MS ISO 50001 Energy Management System or ENMS certification for the Public Works Department Headquarters building in Kuala Lumpur. Ladies and gentlemen, we are committed in developing sustainable infrastructure through the use of green rating tools such as Panarapan Hijau or PH, Malaysian Government Reduction and Environmental Sustainability Tool or in short MICRAS. The use of these rating tools are critical to ensure that we keep carbon emissions at the minimum while striving to meet projects requirement. The Standard of Green Product Scoring System or GPSS is also in place to support the Government Green Procurement or GGP initiative which aims to promote the procurement of green products and technologies in Malaysia. Since 2026, in ensuring that the public projects are implemented sustainably, 
All buildings projects worth more than 20 million and road projects worth more than 50 million ringgit were required to adopt the green rating tool. Under the Ministry of Works, Works Organizational Plan 2021-2025, there's also a program to contribute to the achievements of the country's commitment to reduce carbon emissions or greenhouse gas through carbon emission reduction for buildings occupied and regulated by us, with a target of 1.4 million kilogram of CO2 equivalent per year. Apart from the implementation of the Sustainable Development Initiatives mentioned earlier, the government has also implemented several sustainable projects, such as the hybrid solar system installation project for 134 rural, rural schools in Sarawak, Malaysia. The use of this alternative electricity system is the most optimal solution technically and economically to replace or upgrade the existing system that is a stand-alone diesel generator which has high operating costs and can reduce CO2 emissions. To further support our national commitment towards SDG, an assessment was carried out to understand and quantify the various sources of GHG emission within the construction sector to establish a basis for policymakers to formulate appropriate policies towards reducing the industry-wide GHG emissions. One of our most prolific environmental impact assessment or EIA project is the Rawang Bypass Project which involved the construction of an elevated road structure passing through a gazetted forest reserve. The project was a challenge as it involved many government agencies and public outcry where potential extensive earthworks and deforestation would translate into a permanent law loss to the wild wildlife habitat. In this effort, we are pleased to report that we managed to build a mega structure with minimal sacrifice to forest reserve and control all the environmental elements as per the EIA requirements. To enhance post-project environmental performance, the contractor made a proactive effort by replanting new trees in the area. It is now a well-known project that has taken the interest of the public as it has a breathtaking view from 60 feet above the ground when driving on the road. Ladies and gentlemen, as the custodian of infrastructure development in Malaysia, the Ministry of Work also promotes the internationalization of the construction sector aligned with our objective to provide conducive environment for economic growth and international competitiveness. In facilitating trade, we continue to actively participate in the development of the ASEAN Sectoral Mutual Recognition Arrangement for Building and Construction Materials, or in short BCMRA, with nine other ASEAN members. Currently, there are three products identified under this MRA, namely steel and reinforcement bar, glass and cement. With the ratification of the MRA, the goal is to help reduce time and cost in the import and export processes of these building materials. This platform also allows us to exchange knowledge, expertise, best practices on standards, conformity assessment procedures, and technical regulation on building and construction materials. The latest initiatives under this MRA is the harmonization of standards with Japan, Korea and EU. One of its objectives is to provide sustainable and safe materials in our construction sector. I can see that today's event will also discuss on the prospect of digitalization such as the challenges of digital economy, the future trends and its impact on our economic growth. I believe the adoptions of technological and innovative tools in the construction sector will further strengthen knowledge and information on implementing sustainable practices. The construction sites of the future 
will be almost human free with the way the industrial revolution 4.0 is taking shape around us. By 2050, robots will do the heavy lifting while autonomous cranes and excavators will be handled by social humanoid robots. This is the envisioned future of the construction sector as we gear towards full-scale digitalization within its ecosystem. With the anticipated introduction of robotic applications at construction sites by 2030, the construction industry will, will exponentially reshape and remodel the sector in the way how infrastructure, real estate and other built assets are designed, constructed, operated and maintained. Thus, strong cooperation measures between the government and private sector are essential to ensure technological adoption and improvement within the sector can be successfully implemented. Ladies and gentlemen, I understand you will have a session on the new growth areas that will cover on post-COVID-19 initiatives. And this is particularly interesting as we strive to revive our respective economy. As I see it, we are now presented with a special opportunity facing a special set of challenges from a pandemic that destroyed lives and livelihood to the present threat of climate change. Needless to say, the government, industry players and various stakeholders must converge synergistically in adopting and innovating brave new ideas to help the recovery of the construction sector in Malaysia. The ultimate goals of the Ministry of Work is to provide infrastructure projects that will benefit all nations by developing facilities and amenities for the betterment of the people. This includes maintaining and constructing federal roads and buildings, enhance mobility and connectivity to facilitate the economic growth. In doing so, the Ministry of Work upholds the Wawasan Kemakmuran Bersama 2030 specifically Strategic Thrust 5, which promotes social economic well-being by making the people one of the most important elements of sustainable economic development. Finally, I hope this event will succeed to act as a platform for knowledge sharing and enhance cooperation among us which is in line with the Ministry of Work's objective to build and strengthen entrepreneurs in the construction sector. Thank you.